when we talk about racial equity, the way we define it is ensuring that your race does not define what experiences you're engaged in. I think it would be an understatement to say that we're living through life-changing and challenging times. So welcome to episode two, and I'm sure you're wondering, and maybe you're thinking about what what does equity actually look like? And in some cases, you might be thinking also, what can the future of schools look like and how do we get there? So where I'm gonna take you today through my conversations with district leaders and policymakers is to talk about how they're approaching it and how they're thinking about incorporating equity into the way they work. So I'll, I'll see you in a few minutes. So we are trying to work um, through how we can at least meet the needs of our most vulnerable students, uh, meaning our early learners, our students with special needs, our English learners, uh, to make this possible. When we talk about racial equity, the way we define it is ensuring that your race does not define what you become, what outcomes you have, what opportunities you receive or what experiences um, you're engaged in in Alexandria City Public Schools. How should it look when you, someone comes to visit one, a, a school that's doing this well? Like, how, how can you tell so, it actually working? I think first and foremost, you airing your dirty laundry and talking about the achievement gap and opportunity gap issues that, that are prevalent in every school division across this country right now. I think you also have to be unapologetic around making people uncomfortable. You know, uh, one thing that makes, you know, any person typically very uncomfortable is when you begin to talk about the big word race, right? People start squirming in their seats. They start getting nervous. You know, an anti-racist school division, they're going to be making people feel uncomfortable all the time. Like that's going to be the norm. That's going to be something that they're leaning into. Um, you also want to be able to be, and what we're striving to be, is a school division that unapologetically calls people out on their racist actions and behaviors and practices, period, right? And if we're saying we're going to be a school division that will not tolerate inequities or that will not tolerate racism, then we have to be unapologetic in calling people out on that and unapologetic of letting people go who don't believe in that, you know? Um, and I think that is a very tough thing for many school divisions, um, you know, to do across this country. Very early on, we started a journey. The board, even in the interview process, said, what are you gonna do about these schools that are not performing up to par, that are below, significantly below others? And one of the things we found that the board pointed out to me is that the district at that time often talked about, well, we're outperforming the state and the nation and the region, but no one ever pointed out that the white kids and the Asian kids were significantly outperforming the black and Hispanic kids and the poor kids and the special needs kids. And so early on in my tenure, the board and I agreed, we were always gonna put truth on the table and we were gonna look at all data for all kids. And I think that's the first step forward for anything when the community who, who sees and knows that inequitable practices have been in place, can see the governing body and the superintendent talking about these things publicly, it changes the dynamic of the organization. But then we put plans in place and over about a three to five year window, something as basic as having an aligned, guaranteed and viable curriculum for all students in all classrooms and all schools, that is the foundation of equity in education. And then you overlay that with strong core beliefs and commitments that all children will achieve their full potential and that we're going to be inclusive and that all kids will be valued. We've brought our profile of a graduate to bear for all students. And so the whole tone of our work has shifted. And I'm proud because when I got here, we had several schools that were kind of F rated in need of recovery. Today, we have none. You know, we, we've increased um, graduation rates for all student groups. We have raised performance for all student groups. We're still working 
on some of those equitable issues, though, especially with our poor children. We realized in our district, race can present an issue when it comes to behavior and discipline. But we, but as of last year, for the first time, the district was proportionate in according to the state standard on our discipline referrals. So we're all the indicators you would look at to measure whether you have an equitable environment. We are making significant progress or achieving those indicators. But it's taken a mindset from the top and the leadership team feeling passionate about it. And really where the work is done is having high accountability for the, the principals and the teachers and the schools to live, teach, and work in a way that's equitable and to change the language around those kids from those kids to our kids. They're all our kids and I'm gonna be responsible for them. The blue sky would mean that every child, first and foremost, every child has internet access in their household. To me, that's a utility. Um, there's really no reason why it hasn't happened until now. Um, I mean, there's certainly reasons, but no excuses. Um, and it really is essential. It's a generational game changer for a family to be able to access the internet in their household. Um, the other thing too that I think is going to be really, really important for a blue sky is for every child to have a device that they can use that is their own, whether the schools purchase it or the households purchase it. But to me, that's essential um, to have their own. We have too many families that have to share across mm -hmm. multiple kids in the families. And we know that, you know, that personal information that gets stored there and the, the time it takes to upload and download and all that, it just is um, taxing for, for kids to have to share with multiple others in their families. Um, and so um, I would want to think of it in that way first, of just having mm -hmm. access, just like simple basic needs, right? access, basic needs. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you know, Blue Sky is the basic needs that the schools provide are go well beyond academics. And um, so we are in the middle of the pandemic right now, and we have sought waivers in order to ensure that families can, and children can get food. And we've mm -hmm. been making sure that families can have access to health care even when there's not a hospital nearby. Mm -hmm. um, we have social workers who are out, you know, when the kids are not showing up for school or showing up for online learning, they're out and about and they're recognizing that many of these children are becoming victims of domestic abuse in a way that we've not seen before. Um, and so schools deal with this all the time. Uh, we've not dealt with it in this way or at this level. And I, I would think that in Blue Sky, we would, we would actually have better systems in place to support ch children and families mm -hmm. so that it doesn't fall on the, st the doorsteps of the school system itself all the time. And if it does, then we need to fund schools accordingly. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that's really happened. We are responsible for the community's two most important assets, their children and their money. And people have a very vested interest in both of those things and therefore in the school system. Now we're a bureaucracy and it's hard sometimes to break down the barriers of the bureaucracy because we wanna set up policy and procedures and processes and systems and rules and guidelines and just basically publish it. But we kind of see what happens when when you do that and people don't like it then you start to have churn on your school board it's negative it's a negative environment so actually in our district just in the last couple of years we've really we we, we coined the phrase collaborative communities in policy several years ago we talk about the idea there are things you need to communicate to you know to communicate to your community and that's that's all you're going to do is just communicate you're just going to tell them there's times you're going to consult with them where you're going to say, hey, give us your information. You know, we're going to ask you to your feedback on this survey. Other times we're going to truly collaborate and bring them to the table with, you know, to bring their ideas and thoughts. And then other times we're going to partner where it's where they're bringing resources and they're bringing ideas. And it's more of a real mutual public-private kind of partnership. A lot of communities, when you're trying to, to be equitable, 
meaning, not equal, because equal means everybody gets the same, right? But when you're trying to be equitable, you sometimes find certain individuals in the community that says, you're taking from my child to give to that child, or you're watering down a curriculum, or you're uh, causing me to lose, you know, the experience or the resources in my school to give to that school. And what we have to uh, get to the point of is understanding that when you are meeting students where they are and not necessarily where you want them to be, that is going to require different forms of resources and different amounts of resources. And I can use some of our schools, for example, you have a particular school where the free reduced lunch population is under 20%, right? Compared to a school on the other side of town, that's almost 90% free and reduced lunch. The school that's 90% free and reduced lunch are going to need additional resources because the kids um, who have you know, more financial means, they're getting the access and they're having the experiences that these students on the other side of town are not. So it is our responsibility as a school division to ensure that we're allocating the funds for what kids need, not what's equal to every school division because every child needs something different. How do we actually educate the populations that you're trying to serve around equity and how to make the appropriate ask from the district on what they need so that you could uh, adapt and respond to their specific needs? Because I think that's the other part of it. There's been a lot of times where educators have said, you know, this is the best way to do something to a population. And oftentimes maybe it hasn't actually met the needs of that population. That's why it's so key to have, for example, we have a family and community engagement department in Alexandria City Public Schools. And specifically, it was developed to, um, to work with our underrepresented populations uh, within our city. These are communities and voices that are typically not heard. Um, they may not know how to navigate the public education system or the American system because many of our families are immigrants in, in Alexandria City Public Schools. Um, so you have to make sure that you're meeting the community where they are and that you're utilizing leaders within those communities to hear the actual voices of the people. What should a district be asking the community so that they could actually get the right information? We all know that depending on how you ask the question, you get different the answers you want to. It's true. But I think the first thing you should always ask any community person is what do you know about us? Right, because that gives you some insight to what they believe about the organization and what they've heard about the organization. Um, and they might say, I don't know anything about you, right? So, you know, that gives you just a clearer understanding of where they stand in regards to, you know, knowledge about the organization. And then I think that then you can take that opportunity to begin to talk about the mission, the vision, and the core values um, of any organization because really those three components should drive all of the work of a school division and of a school. Um, and they, I, th I think that's why it's key, especially when you're developing a strategic plan. Like it is so important to have that vision so that you are able to explain where the organization is trying to go in the future and that you have a mission of this is what we stand for right now. This is why we exist today. Um, and then having some core values so that you're able to express this is what we believe and this is why we believe it. Um, and I think that if you can start at that place and you can have some two ways, you know, some discourse around that, um, I think that that's a starting point, you know, you, you then have an open door to begin to talk about, okay, well, these are some of our challenges and these are uh, some of the things that we've been faced with or obstacles and barriers that we've been faced with. And this is how we're planning to overcome. You can start getting into your goals and the outcomes that you're seeking, but you got to start with that mission, that vision and the core values first. Welcome back. And now that we've talked about equity and community engagement, that was a little surprise for you guys. And next, the next episode, we're going to talk about how we do it and the behavioral change that's required, the heart that's required. And I'll also have some tips. So check out the next episode. Talk to you soon. To me, it goes back to that every person that's part of our school system feels valued and feels that they are part of the solution. We start by building confidence in the people 
that are approaching this work. 